economic stratification in this country, the division between black, between poor and rich also falls along racial lines in many instances. So again, you see the death penalty just reproducing so many of the things that are wrong with contemporary society. And kind of going back to the, uh, the public defender issue is the question of innocence. The death penalty does have a terrifying tendency at punishing innocent individuals, which fortunately is something that has gotten a lot of attention lately in the mainstream media and in a lot of discussions about capital punishment. A lot of this is due to the fact that innocent people can't afford good attorneys who are willing to fight for them. Rather, they're stuck with court appointed attorneys who show up to trial drunk or stoned or fall asleep during the trial. Uh, for instance, Francis Newton, one of the cases we just uh, recently worked on and unfortunately ended in our execution, was represented by the notorious Ron Mock, a man who has currently been suspended in the state of Texas and isn't allowed to try capital cases because he has more former defendants on death row than any public defender in the state. So by and large, even individuals who have strong, compelling cases for innocence, that means nothing if you don't have a lawyer who is willing or able to make that fight for you and present that evidence. Stanley Tukey Williams is another case. In retrospect, he had so many claims for innocence, but during his initial trial, he didn't have a, uh, a defender who was equipped to bring that case to the court. Um, to give some statistics, uh, the Northwestern Center on Wrong Full Conviction estimates that at least 38 people have been executed since the Greg versus Georgia did. Um, with compelling cases for innocence. And as Randy just pointed out, more than 122 people have been exonerated from death row um, since that decision. Um, so in large part it deals with the socioeconomic variables that we already talked about, but also there's a huge political interest in executing people. Politicians want to show that they're tough on crime. Um, and the Clinton administration, in fact, helped pass a number of reforms in the criminal justice system that made it more and more difficult for people on death row to appeal their cases. And recently, the Patriot Act, which was just renewed, something I read today, has made it even more difficult for people who are confronting execution to make a case for innocence or other reasons why their case should maybe be commuted um, or they should be exonerated from death row. Um, so a combination of political opportunism and economic disparities increases the likelihood that innocent people are going to be executed in this country. Uh, furthermore, working on down the list, there is no evidence that, the cap that capital punishment prevents crime. It simply doesn't. As much as George W. Bush claims that he supports capital punishment because it saves lives, there has been no compelling documentation to support that claim. In fact, states that do have eliminated capital punishment, or nations that have eliminated capital punishment, have seen their crime rates go down since they've made that decision. Um, the former Attorney General of the United States, Janet Reno, who worked for a vehement supporter of capital punishment, Bill Clinton, uh, stated in 2000 that, I have inquired for most of my adult life about the studies, about studies that might show that the death penalty is a deterrent, and I have not seen any research that would substantiate that point. So we have the Attorney General of an administration that was publicly and wholeheartedly in support of capital punishment admitting that there's no documentation that this thing prevents crime. And our fifth and final reason for uh, opposing executions is that the death penalty is cruel and unusual. Now, a lot of this was based on um, problems that have seen some victories as of late. The fact that the United States used to be one of the few nations in the world that executed juveniles, individuals sentenced to death before the age of 18. Fortunately, the Supreme Court has eliminated that as an option for states. Also, the United States used to execute mentally retarded individuals which now is technically illegal, but then you have the issue of representation. There are many cases in which individuals who are mentally retarded can't prove that they are because their incompetent public defender hasn't produced the paperwork in time, or hasn't fought hard enough to show that this person is mentally retarded. Moreover, the United States still does allow the execution of mentally ill individuals, people with mental incapacities that compromise their ability to distinguish right from wrong or make rational decisions. But for many state governments, it is still perfectly legitimate to execute these individuals. Um, other issues have emerged as of late um, regarding lethal injection and the extent to which it actually prevents individuals from feeling pain when they're executed. Several scientific studies have shown that a lethal injection does not render a person unconscious before they're executed. And they actually do feel their body shutting down while they're laying on that gurney. Um, and there's been a lot of controversy surrounding that in the states of Florida and California. Uh, moreover, something that Jonathan, another CPDP member, is going to cover in a moment, 
is that the conditions on death row in many states, but particularly the state of Texas, are absolutely disgusting and run contrary to several prevailing ideas of human rights. So those are five rationales for, uh, for opposing capital punishments. So what I want to deal with now is give you a sense of kind of what we're up against, the pro-death penalty side of the equation, and those who are fighting to retain it, or those who are working to uh, continue it. Uh, what I want to start off is giving you a sense of the state, those in power, those who uphold capital punishments in an official way. And um, in doing that, I actually am going to relate a personal experience I had, which gave me a very tangible, hands-on sense of who we're dealing with, who these people are who are ratifying and perpetuating capital punishments. Uh, like I mentioned, I'm a graduate student, and I recently took a class in the LBJ, or I am taking a class in the LBJ School of Public Affairs called Prisons and Human Rights, in which we talk about human rights issues in prisons. Go figure. But um, we took a trip recently down to Huntsville, which is where we're going on Wednesday, to visit two prison facilities and to have lunch with a man named Doug Drecke, who is head of correctional facilities of the Texas Department of Criminal Justice. Um, as an abolitionist, I realized that I'm not very often going to have the opportunity to be in the same room as the guy who was in charge of managing death row in the state of Texas. So I kind of really resist the temptation to ask him about the human rights conditions on death row right now. As Jonathan's going to share with us, there's been a lot of controversy and actually a protest on death row dealing with those human rights conditions. So I inquired about it to Mr. Drecke. He paused for a moment, looked at me and said, I don't think their protest has any validity. Moreover, he continued to try to reframe the protest as an anti-death penalty protest on death row rather than a protest against inhumane conditions, which is a complete fabrication of the issue. But the reason he did that was because he said that, hey, I'm not the guy to address about this, to attack about capital punishment. This is something that is best dealt with with the legislatures, with the governor, and that these people should be using the means of communication available to them. When I asked what people who are in a holding cell for 23 hours a day and only get one five-minute phone call every six months have as conventional means of communication, he simply said, society, that that is their means of communication. Now, aside from being an utter and complete cop-out, I also took that as marching orders. As a member of society, I should be willing, able, and energized to confront Doug Drecke, Rick Perry, and anyone else in carrying capital punishment. Because what that realized, whenever you confront a leader about capital punishment, the system of criminal justice in Texas and elsewhere is built in a way where everyone has an escape route. Doug Drecke is just doing his job, following the orders of the governor. Rick Perry is just carrying out the will of the people. So taking to its logical conclusion, there's no one to talk to because everyone can always abdicate responsibility elsewhere. That's why it's necessary to confront the system at every possible angle, to send shockwaves throughout the whole thing until it becomes utterly uncomfortable for them to ignore us and to continue carrying out capital punishment. So what I learned in Huntsville was that their ideals, their interests, at this point in history are by and large at odds with ours. There isn't a place at the table or room for conversation about capital punishment. Rather, we're in a decision movement where confrontation is necessary. We're going into the streets, waving signs around, being an irritant to the people who are carrying out the system is the means to go about it. And history shows that that is how movements are started and how they are won. We look to the civil rights movement, the suffragist movement, the anti-war movement. It begins on the streets and it's won on the streets. Um, how am I doing on time? Are we doing okay? Yeah. All right. We have 30 more minutes. <laughs> what? You have till 7. Till 7? Yeah. All right. Well, I want to get down with some time, too. So, what time is it? You go as late as you want. Oh, okay. Well, all right. Um, so, that's kind of a sense of the official side of the equation. Um, but I also want to spend some time talking about kind of pro death penalty, or what's specifically called victims' rights rhetoric. Uh, something that I think is important to engage and pay attention to. I can get on line for this, right? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Cool. Um, something I've studied myself as a graduate student, but also something that is kind of difficult to deal with, because the victims' rights movement and victims' rights movement <coughs> really sensitizes the death penalty and turns it into a personal issue when we as abolitionists prefer to look at it as a social issue. So to just give you a sense of um, what pro-death penalty rhetoric tends to look like, um, one particularly compelling website is 
Is there a way to get this screen going behind the bed? Uh, the what? Behind the bed. Thanks. Kind of good. Cleared the state's death row 
because since 1976, Illinois had exonerated more individuals, 18, than it had executed, 12. And a series of agitated and activist attempts finally awakened George Ryan, a death penalty supporter, to this injustice. And he took the step of clearing the death row, much to the outrage of victims' rights advocates. Um, and this really started a new conversation about capital punishment. Uh, furthermore, New Jersey became the first state in the Union to legislate a moratorium on capital punishment on the basis of fairness and cost. Uh, the fight to save <coughs> Williams, while it didn't succeed in saving Tukey's life, did open up more conversation about capital punishment. And more and more people across the country are talking about the death penalty and its racial and economic implications. Um, recently, here in Texas, Tony Ford, an individual who was sentenced to death with no physical evidence implicating him at all, was supposed to be executed tomorrow. But he has had his execution stayed, so the one piece of DNA evidence found at the scene of the crime can finally be tested by a crime lab outside of the state of Texas. Uh, moreover, Florida and California have begun asking questions about the, the cruel and unusual nature about lethal injection, and two Supreme Court decisions that I mentioned already about the mentally retarded and juveniles have really challenged capital punishment and started get started a conversation about the broad implications of capital punishment. And furthermore, as um, the speech on the video pointed out, international opinion continues to be in favor of the abolitionist cause in the United States. <coughs> so, in closing, I just want to stress the need of how or the importance of you being here, about how vital it is that you engage in activism against capital punishment. Because while it's important to oppose it, <coughs> it's all the more important to fight it, to take it head on and challenge it in all its manifestations, whether it's Doug Drecke working for the TDCJ, Governor Kerry in the mansion, or getting people to sign petitions and educating them about capital punishment. Um, in 1972, the death penalty was eliminated in the United States in the Furman versus George decision, Georgia decision. This happened during the Nixon administration in a conservative Supreme Court. And it happened because there was a vibrant, broad activist movement in favor of justice. We had a civil rights movement, a women's rights movement, an anti-war movement, and a prison reform and anti-death penalty movement. A broad struggle that was focused on the Supreme Court, on the White House, and other seats of power, determined at eliminating capital punishment and other expressions of injustice in our country. And it was shown to be a success. It happened once, and we firmly believe it can happen again. So before we move to Jonathan, I just want to close with um, a Frederick Douglass quotation that I think really articulates where we're coming from. If there is no struggle, there is no progress. Those who profess to favor freedom and yet appreciate agitation are men who want crops without plowing up the ground. They want rain without thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without the awful roar of its many waters. The struggle may be a moral one, or it may be a physical one, or it may be both moral and physical, but it must be a struggle. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did, and it never will. So again, I'm glad you're all here because it needs to be a struggle. Rick Perry will not <coughs> execute individuals because we ask him to. He will if we force him to. So, with that being said, I'd like to turn the floor over to Jonathan, who will talk about some specific cases that we're working on um, with the campaign. <coughs> Right, so you 
you have this sort of huge disparity between but equal is, is never easy. So throughout the early 20th century, you have a whole bunch of sort of renewed abolitionist movements that are pushing for full abolition. So equality. Abolition means equality, right? In that sort of sense, okay? So let's fast forward a little bit to the 1950s. So who, who do you think of in the 1950s and 60s when you think of like civil rights movement? Martin Luther King, any, any other names? Sort of? yes. Not much. Absolutely. Any other names sort of shoot out there? John F. Kennedy. John F. Kennedy. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Rosa Parks. Rosa Parks. Okay, so I'm just going to kind of give you a little history of sort of the civil rights movement. This is going to be, it's going to be basic. All right. Listen. I said in the Middle East, ancient so I'm not uh, So let me give you some key dates. May 17, 1954, Brown versus the Board of Education in Kansas. Does anybody know about that case? Yeah. Right. So what is that? It's so like the, the biggest school or whatever, like, challenged the segregation of public schools. Absolutely. Challenging the segregation of public schools. So separate is not equal, right? And so in, uh, in that decision, the Supreme Court ruled that, hey, separate is not equal, and we need integration. We need, integra we need widespread United States integration. So that happened, right? Sort of. Right away, right? No. No, no. Okay, so, so what happened? Nothing. Nothing. Basically, nothing. In the, in, the, in the next 10 years after that, I think only a couple of counties or something like that had integrated by the government. So, um, December 1st, 1955, does anybody know what that is? December 1st, 1955, Rosa Parks. Rosa Parks. Right. Rosa Parks. So, Plus it was very that's, right? that's really where it all started. 1896. Was it the right? 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 Was it Was it the right? Was it the but she was, she was an activist, she was part of the movement, and she said, look, I want to do something. So she had this really good reputation, reputation she was really respected in society, so she got on the bus, knowing what she was going to do, and she refused to get up on the bus driver as we go, right? So direct, she's very direct and engaged. So there's part of the civil rights movement. September 1957, Central High School, Little Rock, Arkansas. What happened then? Then it Johnson had to call up night. Eisenhower, right. Eisenhower had to send the federal troops to have nine black students admitted into Central High School. Uh, it's Little Rock, Arkansas. August 28, 1963, March on Washington, Martin Luther King, I Have a Dream speech. I have a dream. July 2nd, 1964, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which specifically prohibited discrimination in voting, education, and the use of public facilities. August 1964, of course, the U.S. Senate. Talking right, so we supposedly got bombed. A, sh a ship, a ship in uh, so a ship in the Gulf, an American ship in the Gulf of Tonkin, supposedly got bombed by the Vietnamese people. Turned out to be true, and the job took us over anyway. Yep, August 10th, 1965, Voting Rights Act of 1965 which stated that literacy tests, poll taxes, and other such requirements that were used to restrict black voting and made illegal. April 11, 1968, was the Civil Rights Act of 1968. So the Civil Rights Act of 1964 didn't work for now. The Civil Rights Act of 1968 prohibits discrimination in the sale, rental, and financing of housing. So you have all these things, you have the Civil Rights Movement, and what was the Civil Rights Movement, sort of, what was the driving force? There are four key terms that I think are very good. Direct, action, social, protest. Right? So direct, very confrontational. Action, actually doing something. Social, <coughs> and protest. So we don't do anything bad, okay? So, <coughs> we look at the civil rights movement. Look at the anti-war movement, which is also going on at the time. Confidential, we have women's movements. Prisoner movements, uh, prison right movements. Are things going on? So, in, in, on June 29, 1972, the Furman v. Georgia case was decided. 
And uh, this is based on the eighth and the fourth movement. It's the eighth and the movement. I know the fourth movement. Eighth is cruel and unusual. Eighth is cruel and unusual. Eighth is cruel and unusual. Which basically said there are a whole bunch of problems with death row. There are a whole bunch of problems with the way that capital punishment is being used. And we're going to address those. Justice Stewart, one of the, uh, one of the majority, said that these death sentences are cruel and unusual in the same way that being struck by lightning is cruel and unusual. So being struck by lightning, what do you think about that? It's the one in a chance where it rarely happens and like, it's just a matter of pure chance, right? So people being executed is sort of these <coughs> right? There are, there's a sort of a streamlined real cohesiveness about the death penalty and why people do such things. But then four years later, on July, um, July 2nd, 1976, the Supreme Court rules Greg, Greg v. Georgia that uh, states have sufficiently solved their problems and that everything's okay, right? But here Brian has just laid out all of these problems that we still have with capital punishment. So obviously problems weren't solved. Um, but there are a couple of things that have been happening that are really good. June 20th, 2002, Act of Georgia. You can't execute the military of time anymore. That's not a law. March 1st, 2005, Wilbur B. Simmons can't execute juvenile offenders. That's not a law. So, sort of a picture that's kind of boring. But, so, what are we going to do about it? Is the question. What are some different ways that people can be activists? Protest. Protest. What, what do we do?
crime scene investigation was shoddy. There's over an hour of time unaccounted for during the transfer of her body from the scene of the crime to the board, which was not done by any authorities who were the turn over to the funeral home to do that. During the initial investigation, the main suspect was the police officer Jimmy Fennell, who was Stacy's fiance. Fennell failed the polygraph test in the question, did you strangle Stacy Stites? So that's a pretty easy question, right? No? And you failed. Uh, police failed to search Stacy and Fennell's apartment, the last place she was known to be alive. Two beer cans were found at the scene of the crime, which tested positive for DNA of two police officers and the victim. Rodney Reed Blackburn was guilty of murdering Stacy Stites, a white woman, by an all white jury in Bastrop. Statistics have shown that racial bias exists in the application of the death penalty, including the fact that although over 50% of murder victims are black, over 83% of the victims of death penalty cases are black. So, here you have issues. Reeds couldn't afford a very good attorney. Your family is black. Let's see what happens. There's another organization that we're working with as well. Another group of guys on the drive movement. So here they are. This is Rob Wills, 24, whose uh, execution was a state, actually. Thankfully. Kenneth Foster, Gabriel, I think his last name is Bermuda. No. Reginald, and a couple others. So basically, the drive movement exists to protest the conditions on death row. The conditions on death row are horrible. People are getting gassed. People are getting beaten. People are being deprived of um, rights to take showers, to clean themselves. These guys have to stay in their cells 23 hours a day with absolutely no communication. Their cell is 10 feet by 6 feet, 10 feet by 6 feet, 60, feet, uh, 60 square feet total, and it's actually affordable living conditions. Uh, on top of that, sometimes they're deprived of food, or if they do get food, it's called a food loaf, which is basically all the food of the day is sort of mashed up into one big loaf, sort of given to them. On the floor and their cell, it's really nasty. Um, so, basically, these, these cases that we were working on, uh, and other cases like the Stanton Williams case, we're also working on when we have the Jamal's case, because, because this is a political thing and we're wanting to get involved in So, we want you to get involved as well. Thank you. This is an example of how you can organize around a specific campaign. They did a really good job with this, not just with their website, but also with their uh, activism uh, in the real world. Uh, this was the case of uh, Francis Newton, who was executed last year. Um, but they, they did various things, like uh, set up community forum uh, talks where they invited people of the, of the community to come in and, and talk about their case. And they were really successful at getting their message out to the public. So some of you, I don't know what the situation really is in Kansas or Idaho or wherever, but I mean, if there's some case up there that's, that's going on, you, know, you might want to, when you get back home, take a look at uh, the Francis Newton website and think about maybe whether or not you want to do something similar to what they were, were able to do.